All right. So yeah, talking about garden insects and specifically about insects that cause us problems in our garden. And I will tell you probably, you know, it's kind of a toss up between insects and weeds, which causes the most problems for gardeners. But I will tell you bugs do cause problems because sometimes people, I've had people say they, they just want to give up gardening because the bugs just eat everything. And I feel that's probably an over exaggeration. Um, and so it's just good to be aware of what insects are you're most likely to encounter. And if you are familiar with them and kind of know what to expect, and especially with certain crops, then you can be prepared and kind of deal with them and be watching for them. And, you know, we're trying to do this in a, a safe way for you, whoever's, you know, growing the garden, because uh, that's what it's about, growing your food with healthy um, results and not having a lot of pesticides on your food. So you can grow your own, you can skip most of that and just have organic produce coming from your backyard. So we're going to kind of divide this presentation into three parts. The first one is just kind of a general background on insects. We're going to kind of remember some of the stuff that we were learning in junior high and high school about insects. And then we're going to talk about insect control. And then in part three, we'll talk about specific problems that are going to be on specific crops. And so, um, yeah, just a little bit about background. You know, insects are animals, of course, and they're probably the most um, successful um, group of animals because they're everywhere. And there are thousands of kinds, many different kinds of species. You know, they can tolerate extreme cold, extreme hot, you know, hurricanes, everything. Uh, there will always be insects. And they affect us in lots of different ways. Um, Sometimes when they get into our house, they cause problems. Sometimes they eat our house if they're termites. Uh, they can be annoying. Uh, right now there's a fly buzzing around the room and hopefully he'll just stay away from me. Um, but so one of the ways that they affect us is they cause problems by eating our vegetable crops. And so there's a lot of um, conception that all insects are bad. And of course that's not true. There are lots of good insects. We call those beneficials um, because they provide benefits to the gardens and bad ones we call pests because they are pesky and they cause trouble. So on the beneficials, uh, they kind of fit into two categories and some of them actually do both. Um, but so think of predators are insects that will eat other insects. And so this is good. Um, and pollinators are of course, insects that help to pollinate our vegetable crops, which is great also. And, you know, lots of attention is given to bees, specifically honeybees and bumblebees. But um, there's all kinds of other pollinators, little miniature wasps and uh, moths and flies that do pollinating also. And on the predators, you know, um, some of the predators are specific, like ladybugs pretty much eat aphids, which is great. Um, but then there's some like the praying mantis that will just pretty much eat anything they can get their hands on. So they might actually eat a beneficial insect. Um, anyhow, the, the ladybugs are, are definitely great. So um, there's lots of good ones. And so that's why you, it's good to, to know which insects are causing problems. So you're not just going out spraying, trying to kill all the insects in your garden. You want to protect those predators and those pollinators. A little bit about insect biology. Um, and you don't have to remember this. It's just kind of good to have a little bit of background. So true insect, an adult, will generally have three body sections. You got your head, that middle section, which is called the thorax, and the abdomen, which is down here. And um, on some insects, it's hard to tell because it just looks like it's all the same. Um, it's not very clear. And generally, insects will have six legs and two sets of wings. Um, some will only have one set of wings. Some insects will be wingless. Some of them, it will depend at what stage in their growth they're at. And then usually they have a pair of antenna. And then they have what's called the exoskeleton, um, which just means that they generally have a hard shell to their body because they don't really have bones. So they generally have a hard enough shell to kind of hold their, their body parts in place. And uh, sometimes that causes a problem for us when we're trying to actually get rid of the insects because their hard shell just prevents anything from affecting them. So a little bit about the biology. 
Um, and then there's insect life cycle. Um, and this is a word that I remember from science class, metamorphosis. And all that means is the changing of the life cycle, the different stages that the insects go through. So sometimes it's, um, there's different kinds of metamorphosis. Sometimes there's no metamorphosis, basically it just goes straight from an egg to an adult. Then there's an incomplete where it kind of just goes through three stages, the egg, the nymph, and the adult. And then there's kind of gradual metamorphosis where it just kind of just gradually happens. You really can't tell the difference between the stages. And the complete metamorphosis is the egg, the larva, the poop, pupa and the adult. So that's like with a butterfly or a moth. So like here you see your little egg that's been laid and then the larva hatches, which of course we know is caterpillars. And you see that it's eating, it goes through two or three stages. And in this case, it actually went through five different molts where it sheds and then it goes into the pupa. And then it turns, once it comes out, we used to call that a uh, cocoon, but now they call it a chrysalis or a pupa and then it turns into the adult and it flies off and does adult things. So anyhow, the other thing that's probably more important to be aware of than even that life cycle, although that is helpful, because sometimes you'll see the insects at different stages in their life, um, is the different type of mouth parts. Um, they have different ways that they, they get food and, um, and that's gonna affect what kind of damage they inflict on your plants. So think of like chewing, obviously, that means they have things kind of like teeth. They're called mandibles. And their teeth, um, are, you know, as they chew, they'll make holes in leaves. And of course, that causes problems. Sometimes they actually chew on fruits, um, like tomatoes or peppers or squash. And then there's a kind that's called the piercing and sucking um, mouth parts. So um, like this guy right here, this squash bug basically has a thing, almost looks like a giant straw, kind of like a hypodermic needle or actually this is some other kind of bug, but it's on a tomato and it's sticking this thing right into the tomato. And then it has enzymes, which help to digest part of the tomato. And then it basically sucks it up kind of like a smoothie. And of course that makes the part of the tomato kind of nasty and ruins it, so not good. And then there's what they call rasping, sucking mouth parts. And that's kind of like where it's almost like a file and it kind of files it way into the thing and, and kind of reams it out and then it starts sucking through that. And then there's sponging, which usually does not cause any problems. Um, think of butterflies. They're just got kind of like a, a sponge on their tongue and they're just kind of lapping up nectar. So they're not really making holes in their plants um, that way, but their eggs turn into caterpillars, which do that. And then there's siphoning, which is just kind of just a straw. So really the one that we worry about the most would be this chewing one and the piercing and sucking and to a lesser degree, the rasping will suffer. Um, but the number one and number two are the ones that you're gonna encounter most often. All right, so host plants. Um, many insects favor certain plants or families of plants to feed on and lay their eggs. And this kind of helps um, with identification some because basically if you go out and look at your collard plants, your cabbage and broccoli, you're gonna see sometimes holes on them. And if you look closely, you'll see some little green worms, like right here in this picture, it's kind of camouflaged. Wait, my mouse isn't working, hang on here. There it goes. So right here, you can see this little caterpillar, same color as the leaf. And so this person did not see it until it was kind of big. Um, lots of times they're smaller and you don't see that. Sometimes they're on the underside of the leaf. But that lets you know what you're dealing with. Uh, there's like two insects we'll talk about later that this could be. And so um, pretty much they only feed on members of the cabbage family, cabbage, broccoli, collards, cauliflower, and so forth. Um, but there's other insects that are not specific and they will just pretty much eat anything they can get their hands on. Think of things like Japanese beetles, um, some of the cucumber beetles will just chew on lots of different kinds of things. Um, there's some others. So aphids, aphids will get on many, many different kinds of plants. Same thing with spider mites. Um, but sometimes it is just helpful to know if something is kind of specific to that group of plants because that helps you identify it. And so the damage, let's talk about what kind of damage they do. We talked about that chewing mouth parts, chewing holes in the leaves. 
So here you see a leaf that's got some pretty good holes going on, some small ones that are probably caused by tinier insects. And then as they get bigger, they make bigger bites. And so, you know, this is not ruining the part you're eating here. This is, I think, a bean leaf. Um, so you're not going to eat that bean leaf. But if you have enough holes in it, it's going to reduce the ability of that plant to produce food because plant leaves, as you know, um, capture the sun's light. And that's what's used for photosynthesis. And the plant makes food through that. And then the plant uses that food to either produce green leaves that we're going to eat or it will produce fruits that we're going to eat, or stalks, or stems, or whatever part of the plant we're going to eat. It needs those leaves in order to do that. So if you get too many holes, um, it's going to cause problems, and the plant will not grow like it should. So um, the other way that insects can damage our garden plants is sometimes they'll damage the fruit, and this can be especially upsetting if you've got like some really nice peaches going on, or tomatoes, or apples. Um, or in this case, in this picture below, this is actually uh, a bean, like a green bean. And you can see this little weevil type thing has been making holes right inside um, this bean. Of course, that makes it inedible. Um, here is something that's been attacking these peaches, making holes in it. So um, just, you know, anytime that happens, sometimes it's the sort of thing where you can cut away the bad parts if it's not very extensive. Other times, it kind of just ruins the whole fruit. So um, that can be more of a problem. So again, um, sometimes it's the leaves, sometimes it's the fruit that gets damaged. The other way that insects can damage our plants sometimes is they carry diseases. And so um, specific things, especially the ones with the piercing and sucking mouth parts, um, because they're inserting their, their little you know, needle type thing so they can suck up the the plant tissue, um, if they move from plant to plant and they stop at a plant that has a plant disease, then when they go to the next plant, they will be carrying that disease with them. And so that can be a real problem, especially with certain things um, that like in the cucumber and melon family, um, there's some wilt diseases and virus diseases. Um, anyhow, so it's just spread from plant to plant to plant. So here you can see like a cantaloupe plant that um, has got a, a wilt disease that probably has been spread by sucking insects. All right, now we will talk about insect control. And, you know, there's many, many different ways to control insects. We'll talk a little bit about some of the different ways. Um, one of the ways that most people think about, or think people think about the most, is of course getting some kind of spray. So you see a bug, and instantly you mix up some spray and go out and kill those bugs. And so unfortunately, again, as we talked about, sometimes you'll be killing good insects, so you don't want to do that. Um, and the other thing is sometimes there's natural predators out there that are trying to take care of the insect population. Sometimes it gets out of control and they may not be able to do it all. But if you spray and kill everything, then you're killing those good predators. In this picture, we're seeing a ladybug and you can see this ladybug chomping down on this aphid. Uh, here's some aphids, which are little sucking insects that will cover little plants. These ones here are kind of dark, and they're just all over this plant. And this aphid literally is just chomping down on it. If you ever want to watch some entertaining stuff, go on YouTube and look up things like ladybugs eating insects um, or eating aphids, and then look at praying mantises and some of the other insects, some of the the predator beetles out there. It's just really kind of interesting to watch and see how effective they are. Um, we actually tried some lacewing, um, introducing some lacewings into our greenhouse. And the larva of the lacewing, which is like a little tiny fly, the larva is kind of a little tiny little critter that's not full grown. And it will walk around and eat aphids. And we got to watch this. They're very tiny, so you don't get to see them unless you're looking really close. But it's just kind of fascinating to see them doing that important job of helping to control the aphids. There is a concept in insect control that you might read about. Um, it's called integrated pest management. Sometimes it's abbreviated IPM. And so the definition here is, um, so first of all, it's integrated, meaning you're coordinating different techniques, different ways to control the insects, different practices that you can do. And you're kind of putting all these different things into one plan but you're not just gonna count on one thing to control the insects. 
and at different stages you might be doing different practices so but you're going to put them all together so they're going to be integrated into this plan then of course pest is whatever organism that's causing the problem generally we're thinking of insects but you know it also would apply to other animals um, weeds or diseases you can use ipm you know practicing for that um, and of course management and management has a little bit different connotation than just complete control. It does not mean like you're going to totally eradicate the pest, but you're going to control it to the level so there is just not much damage that you don't really have to worry about. It. You may not kill every last aphid in your greenhouse, but if you get most of them so that they're not causing hardly any damage, then you're good. So um, we're just trying to keep that damage to an acceptable level. Um, so Probably the most important thing would be insect pest identification. Again, you don't want to just grab a spray and start spraying because A, you don't even know if that insect that you saw was causing the damage that could be a beneficial. Um, sometimes what happens is people see holes in their leaves and they look around and they don't see any insects. And sometimes that's because the insects have already moved on. Lots of times when an insect is in a certain stage of life, like a little caterpillar, it does its eating. And then as soon as it's done and ready to move on to the next stage, it stops chewing holes. And so you stop getting holes. So I tell people to look at the leaves and see if you see the new leaves, if they still have holes in them. Or if the new leaves are clear, but it's only the old leaves, usually that's a good sign that the insect pest has moved on and is not actually present. But as far as identifying, you're going to look for the insect that actually is doing the damage. And the best thing is if you can actually capture one, like grab a jar or a little container of some kind and catch one or several. And sometimes you can look at them with a magnifying glass if they're kind of tiny. And you can look on the internet and see. Um, this um, PowerPoint will also be available as a resource on our uh, website. So if you want to look at the pictures of some of the specific insects, you can see if what you have in your garden matches up with what we were talking about. So there's also insect guidebooks and internet resources. Um, you can actually bring us a bug in a jar or a bag if you want, and we'll try to figure it out for you if it's something pretty simple. It's also possible to actually send insects to the University of Missouri or probably University of Kansas. I'm just familiar with sending them to the University of Missouri, and they can identify a specific insect pest and tell you what it is and give you some advice about it. Um, the problem is, lots of times, if you just pick a book out of the library, there are like so many thousand kinds of beetles. You could look for days and not figure out which kind of beetle you have. But if you know what kind of plant it was on and you have an idea of what it might be, then we can probably figure it out. So. And of course, sometimes the pest actually looks similar to the beneficials. There are some beetles that, um, like the ladybug, you've seen those. There's actually another bug that looks kind of like that called the cucumber beetle, only it's a different color. Um, there is a bug that looks kind of like a giant ladybug, but it's actually a bean beetle and it chews big holes in the leaves. So sometimes it's just hard to tell because they might look like a beneficial. You still just want to be very careful not to kill off your good bugs. That's why you want to try and identify them, especially the pollinators. You do not want to try and kill your pollinators. So the important parts of the IB, IPM, um, again, so pest identification, trying to figure out what it is that you're trying to watch for. And then, um, and of course, these eight things, um, this is not something that you'll necessarily always do in your backyard. On a limited basis, you might be doing it. Um, and so it's just kind of good to have this perspective. Um, but this is like someone who's a professional grower, like maybe they're growing big vegetable crops in the field or, or fruit trees in the orchard and they're growing a lot. So again, identification, that's helpful whether you're a backyard grower or you're growing several acres, figuring out your pests. And so monitoring, and all, all that means is kind of watching and sampling. And in this case, um, there's a little trap here, and it's got some sticky stuff on it, and it's got something in here that attracts the insects in. And so in this case, the insects come in here, and they're going to what's ever inside, they're a little attracted, and they're getting stuck on the sticky stuff. And so they get stuck there, and they die. Well, this lets the people know when they start putting the sheet out, it's empty. 
And then at first, maybe there's just one or two. And then at some point, a whole bunch start coming and start getting stuck. That's letting them know that now it's time to maybe do something about it. Because if you do something too early, before there's very many of the pests, then you're kind of wasting your time and wasting your spray and energy, whatever, whatever else you're doing. So you're gonna do some monitoring and sampling, trying to figure out what's going on. But then also you need to know the life cycle of this insect pest. Like where does it lay its eggs? When does it lay its eggs? Does it lay them over the winter? Are they in the soil? Um, do they come out in the spring? Um, do the caterpillars, are they the ones that cause the trouble because they do all the eating and the butterflies just fly around and look beautiful? Um, so knowing that the particular life cycle is very helpful. Um, and then there are preventive cultural measures that you can do. Um, like sometimes that might be like, um, you might mound up the soil a little bit around your squash plant so that it makes it hard for the squash bug to lay, or the squash vine borer to lay its eggs right there. Um, you might put a screen over certain plants like your cabbage and broccoli plants, you can put some row cover over it or some screening and that will keep the, the butterflies and moths out that lay the eggs that cause the caterpillars to eat those plants. Um, so those are different cultural measures. You might till your garden up in the fall, kind of, you know, destroy insect eggs that are laid in the top inch or two of the soil. So um, there is also modifying the environment. And I guess actually that one of the things I just mentioned, uh, like putting a screen over your plant, that would be modifying your environment. Um, there's just some other different ways that you can do things um, to control the environment a little bit. And then of course, mechanical controls, that would be things like tilling, um, also like picking insects off by hand. It sounds kind of primitive. Sometimes with certain insects, it's actually not too difficult. You can just pick them off by hand and get rid of them. That would be a mechanical control. Or believe it or not, there's actually um, some people do some vacuuming. There's times when you can actually use like a small handheld battery powered vacuum and you can suck up certain insects. Um, obviously, you would not want to do this with your good vacuum that you use in your house, but a small battery-powered um, vacuum. You just have to be careful that you're not going to damage leaves and suck the leaves up. Um, but there's times when something like that is helpful, like with something like squash bugs, you could just vacuum those guys up to get rid of them. Same thing with Japanese beetles. And then there's biological controls. That's where you're introducing some sort of organism, like maybe a bacteria or possibly another insect that's going to come in and eat that insect that you're trying to control. And then, of course, there are pesticides that you can use. And we'll talk about a little bit about organic pesticides that are safe to use. They don't persist long in the environment. And so that's why we want to use pesticides responsibly and not just grab something that we're not really sure what it is from the store that might not be good for us or for the environment and start spraying that. Excuse me, let me grab a drink of water here. All right, so something to think about is, and you'll learn this as you study different insects, is trying to control the insects at the most vulnerable stage of their life. Like squash bugs <coughs> in particular are um, kind of difficult to control. Once they get to be an adult, um, they have hard shells and not much affects them. And they go over the winter as an adult. And then the adults, you know, lay their eggs. And as they do that, the eggs are there, but you can't really do much of the eggs because they have kind of a hard shell. But when the little babies hatch out, these little immature uh, nymphs, they're called, see how they're kind of soft, their bodies are soft, they haven't developed the hard skin yet. That is when they are vulnerable and you can spray them. Um, so that works uh, with some organic sprays at that point. Um, but some other ways that you might control this pest would be um, as an adult, you might handpick the adult, adult insects and get rid of them. Um, you can drop them in like a can of soapy water and drown them or whatever you want to do. Um, and then the eggs, you can actually pick a cluster of eggs off just by tearing off a part of the leaf and get those eggs off before they hatch. So there's different stages. Um, 
but thinking about how an insect is vulnerable, you know, to being controlled at certain stages in its life will be helpful. And in some cases, like a butterfly, you might not be wanting to control the butterfly killing the adults, but controlling the, you know, the larvae, the caterpillar, they're eating up your leaves is an easier thing. So, all right, a little bit about pesticide safety. And again, pesticide is kind of a broad term. Uh, pesticides would include insecticides using to kill um, insects. It would also include fungicide, which is used to kill um, fungus diseases. And then there's also um, herbicides, which are used to kill um, plants in general to control weeds. And so we're not going to talk too much about weed control or fungus control, we're basically talking about insect control, so organic insecticides. So I do recommend using organic sprays. And um, sometimes people say their organic sprays aren't very effective. And sometimes that's because maybe they just made up an organic spray. They saw a recipe on the internet for mixing together some garlic and um, some, something else and a little bit of soap and some things and I don't know, some ginger and then spraying that. And that may work for certain things, but might not work for everything. So um, homemade sprays, uh, generally you can use them, but try and read what they're good for. And of course, follow the directions. Uh, but the organic sprays that you buy um, at the store, we sell some here at the community gardens. Um, they're going to be specific purposes and specific insects. So, um, for instance, there is a product we call uh, BT or dipel dust. It comes as a dust and you sprinkle it and basically it kills members of the caterpillar family. And so specifically, it's very useful for controlling those caterpillars that we talked about which we'll talk about in a little bit, that get on your cabbage, your broccoli, your collards, your cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all those things, kale. And um, it's good for that, but it only kills members of the caterpillar family. So if you use that dipel dust and you're trying to control aphids, trying to control spider mites or cucumber beetles or squash bugs, it's not going to do a thing. And if you just do that and think that it will control everything, you're going to be disappointed. So use organic sprays, read the labels. We'll have some guidelines with you for you about what sprays to use for which insects. Um, always follow directions. Don't think that just because it says one tablespoon per gallon of water, think that, you know, then two tablespoons would be better because it would kill harder or better, whatever. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it can be dangerous. Don't spray on windy days because the spray may go into places that you don't want it to. Um, also might actually blow back on you. Always wear proper protection. Um, I didn't put it here, but I should add it, is that when you're spraying, essentially you're walking backwards through your garden because then you're not walking into the area that you just sprayed. The, the good thing about the organic sprays is they're relatively low toxicity and also they do not persist long in the environment. So lots of times with the organic sprays, what they recommend is to do your spraying in the evening uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because the pollinators are not likely to be out, things like bees and bumblebees, honeybees, other pollinators. Um, so they're not likely to be out in the evening, but also the spray will last longer and be more effective if it's not being the sun not shining on it because the sun helps to break down the organic spray so they don't last too long, which is good. But if you do it in the daylight in the morning, um, the sun will start breaking it down and won't have as long of an effect on it. So for a couple of reasons, it's a good idea to spray in the evening. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that, you know, there's lots of garden insects or critters um, that aren't actually pests. And, you know, some of them can be terrifying to some people because all kinds of little critters are terrifying. I'm just thinking if I saw a spider this big in my garden, I would be alarmed, but not afraid. Um, but some people hate spiders and I, I, I get the whole fear of spiders thing. They can be very frightening. Um, but out in the garden, they're actually doing good because they are eating other insects or eating insects because spiders technically are not true insects. 
Um, ants are generally not a pest in the garden. Sometimes it may seem like they're a pest because um, they built a nest right in your raised bed. Um, generally that happens when the soil is dry a little bit and they think this is a good place to build a home. Once you start watering that soil, they'll figure it out pretty quick that this is not a good place to live because it's going to flood them out every time you come in water. So that's good. Um, lots of times people see dragonflies, especially if you're near any kind of bodies or water. Here's a dragonfly. I remember as a child, we thought dragonflies were terrible and that they would come and sting you, but they can't actually sting people. They actually eat some insect larvae, which are good. Um, and then of course, the famous roly-poly. Um, people worry about that. They, they worry about that they're going to eat their plants. They don't. They might feed a little bit on some roots occasionally, but really roly-polies are digesting dead organic matter in the soil. So they're being helpful in doing the composting, turning organic matter into good compost. So roly-polies generally are not a, a real problem. On the other hand, there are some other pests and things that we will talk about, and they're not all insects. So really, this garden insects class would be better titled just garden pests, because we're going to talk about some of the small ones. Although we will have another workshop later, probably in the summer, where we talk about larger garden pests, things like squirrels and rabbits and deer and all that stuff. So stay tuned for that. We'll do that at another time. These are the tiny little ones, common garden pests. and so. If you're not familiar with any of these, one up on the top is a slug. And then we'll talk about this later. And this right here is a squash bug. And then over here, we have a cabbage looper. And see how it does the inchworm type thing. So we'll see a little bit more about them. So now we're going to talk about specific insects that are cause problems in our garden. And these are the most common ones, the ones that are most likely to see problems with. Um, so aphids. Um, aphids attack many kinds of plants. Um, we get them in our greenhouse occasionally on peppers and eggplants, and they're hard to control. Um, they have piercing, sucking mouth parts, and they're very tiny, and they can multiply very, very fast. Um, one adult aphid can give birth to many, many, and the way that I understand it is they actually have live birth at most of the the year and then at different times they do lay some eggs but mostly it's live births and they just can multiply very very fast um, they're kind of small and hard to see lots of them are green sometimes they're red some are black <clears throat> but often you see the green ones so you don't see them for a while um, they particularly like the tips of the plant because that's the softest most succulent part um, so lots of times like Oh gosh, on a morning glory vine or a eggplant or a tomato or a pepper, look at the very tip and that's where you're likely to see aphids if they do exist. As they spread out um, from there, lots of times they'll be on the underside of the leaf. And so here's like a tomato leaf, I think it's tomato could be bean, um, where there's lots of aphids on the underside. That gives you just an idea of how small they are. This picture up here makes them look big, but here's like an adult and here's some young aphids coming along. The other thing is aphids can spread diseases because of those piercing, sucking mouth parts. So it is good to control them. Um, one of the ways you can actually control aphids, like let's say you bring home some plants that came from a greenhouse. They could have a few aphids on them because this, this happens with greenhouses. They love multiplying inside the greenhouse. Um, you can actually just wash them off, like take your plants over to a, the hose um, and just turn the hose on moderately strong and turn the plants upside down and just wash the underside of the leaves, turn it over and kind of wash it around where the tips of those stems are. And you'll just wash those aphids away and they're not going to make their way back. So that's a real easy way to control aphids when you're planting. Uh, if you don't have too many plants, you could actually do that in your garden. Sometimes though it's just helpful to kind of hold the plant up so that the force of the water won't actually knock the plant over. Um, so water spray does great. There's some biological controls, things like ladybugs, lacewings. There's some predator wasps that you can get. Um, there's a product that's made out of soap called insecticidal soap. And a brand name for it is called Safer Soap. 
It uh, doesn't work on everything, but it works pretty good on aphids because it basically coats their skin with this soapy film and kind of suffocates them. It's also good for spider mites. And then there's organic insecticide sprays like pyrethrin and neem oil um, that help to control aphids too. So lots of different ways um, to control aphids. And generally it's not a huge problem, but if it does get to be a problem, yeah, you do want to take some steps to control it. All right. How many people, all right, you can't raise your hand, sorry. But many gardeners, most gardeners I know, maybe not this bad, come out to their cabbage plants, their broccoli plants, collards, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, all those things, and we'll find small holes in them. And if you aren't paying attention, this is how bad it can get. This is what happens when the little white butterflies or some brown moss go in the eggs at different times and they hatch out, they turn into hungry, hungry caterpillars that just munch their way right through. And, um, you know, you see a white butterfly, it looks kind of harmless, but what it's doing is going around laying eggs on your brassica plants, members of the cabbage family. So you definitely want to do something about it before it gets this bad. So here's the two pests. One of them is called the imported cabbage worm. And it's imported just because it came from some other country. I don't even remember. And it doesn't matter now at this point. They're here to stay. Um, it's a little slender green caterpillar. Here's a picture right here down in the lower left hand corner. Again, talk how camouflaged it is. This one's starting to get pretty good size. Um, it's the larva that comes from the white cabbage butterfly. This one right here. They're really common. They're out right now. You have your broccoli and cabbage plants. Um, so right here, it's feeding on the nectar from something else that likes to lay its eggs on the cabbage and broccoli, colored plants, kale, because it knows that's what its babies are going to need to eat. When those caterpillars hatch out of their eggs, um, they have to eat these kinds of plants. They can't eat certain other plants. Sometimes they'll try and they'll eat a little bit, but in order to be successful, they go through the whole life stage, life cycle stages. They need to get members of this family. So fairly easy to control with that BT product that I told you about that only affects members of the caterpillar family. Uh, again, a brand name for it would be Dipel Dust. Um, it also comes as a spray. Sometimes it's called Thuricide or just BT spray. And that's what it's used for. It's really relatively harmless um, for people, pets, so it's a really safe uh, insecticide to use. The other one is spinosad, the one that's kind of hard to pronounce or spell there. Almost looks like spinosad, but um, I think the correct pronunciation actually is spinosad. And it also affects members of the caterpillar family. And so sometimes if the BT is not working for you, try the spinosad. It also will affect some other insects, some beetles and things like that. So it has a little more broad spectrum use. Uh, spinosad um, also comes pretty much as a spray, not as a dust. Um, there's a brand name that you can buy. Um, it's called Captain Jack's. Uh, actually, the full name is Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. And that's because spinosad was a biological uh, control a bacterial product they found in the Caribbean. Uh, anyhow, so there's a long story you can read about that on the internet if you want. Uh, but it is useful for controlling this particular pest also. Um, there's another one that's pretty similar. I don't differentiate a lot other than you're not going to see a white butterfly. You're going to see this brown moth, and you may not even see it because, A, it doesn't show up as well. Moths are kind of trickier flyers. Also, they fly generally at night. Um, so you're not going to see them unless you're out in the garden in the evening or early morning or overnight with flashlights. Um, the little difference on the worm here is instead of just being a straight worm like that other one, it, it does this inchworm thing, and that's how it moves. The other one moves more like a caterpillar. This one does the inchworm type thing where it hunches up and then stretches out and moves its little legs that way. Um, so it's the larva. It, again, also feeds on members of the cabbage family. Broccoli, cabbage, collards, kale, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, etc. And uh, again, easy to control because it's basically a member of the Lepidoptera. Anything that's a moth or a butterfly is in the same family, 
and it's fairly easy to control with the DT or the split up. All right, there is the potato beetle, and it's called the Colorado potato beetle because maybe that's where it came from. I'm not sure. It does affect us here sometimes, but this is not something that you're going to see every year. Um, in fact, I haven't seen very much of it lately. Um, whereas, like that, the cabbage loopers and cabbage worms, you're going to see those every year. It's, if you grow those plants, they're going to show up. This one just shows up all of a sudden you start noticing there is some holes in your potato leaves. The good news is it's not hurting your potatoes that you're going to eat, but if there's too many of them, they'll eat all the leaves and the potatoes won't grow very well. So this is a beetle. It has um, this larva, this kind of grub looking thing, and it really chomps down on the foliage and eats big holes in it, the adults do too. Uh, it's kind of hard to kill, especially at this stage with the shell on it was hard. It's a little bit easier to control. This is one of those things that probably the easiest thing to do, because there's not that many, is just pick them off and drop them in a can. Sometimes people will put them like in a can of kerosene or something like that. Um, this used to be something that was always given to kids on the farm to do uh, as a job, because it takes time. Go out and pick all the potato beetle larva off and the little beetles and just drop them in the can and get rid of them. Um, so that used to be a job for kids. Um, but you know, if you don't have very many, it's not too hard to do. Uh, if you have a lot and you feel the need to spray, I would use the spinosis because this is one of the beetles that it does help control. But pretty much just pick some potatoes. This one, on the other hand, is also a beetle. And it's called the spotted cucumber beetle. It's called spotted because it has spots on it. Um, it's kind of this lime green color, you know, distant relation to ladybugs, but a bad little beetle. Um, it's interesting at a different point in its life, in its life stage, life cycle, the, the larva, they actually feed on the roots of corn plants. And they're called the corn rootworm. Sometimes you'll hear like farm commercials talking about controlling corn rootworm. And what they're talking about is controlling the larva of the cucumber beetle, which goes out and, you know, eats the roots of the corn plant. Um, but when it grows into an adult, it starts eating other things. And it does like to go um, on the flowers of many plants. So like think of cucumber flowers, squash flowers, watermelon flowers, it likes to eat the pollen and um, different things from there. But it also will chew holes and things, and it does spread disease <coughs> like that bacterial wilt in the cucumber. It can be difficult to control. Um, so the neem oil is helpful. That's an organic spray. Irethrin sometimes is effective. Spinosad also sometimes effective. Um, sometimes they don't work super well, so try something else. Um, and there are certain varieties of cucumber that um, don't attract this. One of them is uh, the county fair cucumber um, that we have. I don't know if we were able to get it this year, but it does not attract the cucumber people so much. Um, and there's some other cucumbers that you can cover them up and screen them out, um, like the diva cucumber. Um, does not have to have insect pollinators, so you can just put the row cover over it and forget about these little cucumber beetles. Just screen them out. Cutworms, uh, again, something that doesn't happen every year. Sometimes it's a problem. Cutworm is a little caterpillar. Um, again, a pretty just plain old moth that you wouldn't recognize. Um, lays the eggs, and then the eggs when they hatch, they turn into little worms. They get kind of fat pretty quick. And what they do, they're kind of like a little chainsaw. And they will basically cut off little plants right at the ground, just like, you know, and the, the thing falls over. So that's kind of the, the sign that it was actually a cutworm. Is like if you see a little young tomato plant or a corn seedling that's up here at the top, and it's just fallen over, but you see it, that generally is a cutworm. And basically it does, it just kind of wraps itself around this little stalk and eats in a circle and then it falls over. And then it goes on to another stalk. 
Um, for some reason, it just did not like to eat the whole thing. It kind of has to wrap itself around. So sometimes, you know, um, you know, you just come out in the morning, you see this happen. It's really annoying. Um, once the plant gets big enough, like a tomato plant or a pepper, once it gets big enough, the stalk is too big and too hard and it can't really do that. But a little tiny young baby tomato plant, it can do that. Um, bean plants, corn, different things. Generally, this happens at night. Um, the adults, you can see it's just a common moth. So again, the BT or the spinosad would work as a spray. Uh, but generally, um, what you might have to do is like put a little collar. Sometimes we'll use like people put a little aluminum foil around the base of their tomato plant. You can just make like this little cut out some cardboard or some uh, paper. And for some reason, they just aren't very good at climbing over stuff like this. and They don't know what's on the other side. So it generally works pretty well and keeps them out. So cutworms generally not a big problem, but when they do show up, they are very annoying. All right, this one's another caterpillar and another member of the Lepidoptera, the butterfly and moth. Um, the larva, the caterpillars, are actually kind of beautiful, um, but they, the parsley worm, they pretty much eat only members of the carrot family. And so if you're not familiar with that family, um, it's carrots and parsley, um, dill, um, cilantro, um, I think what else? Queen Anne's lace is a wildflower, um, fennel, so different things like that. Those are all in the, the umbelifery family, which is basically the parsley and carrot family. And so they have flat flowers and the caterpillars, you all of a sudden you'll see some holes like in the foliage of your parsley plant and some leaves gone. And also you realize there's this caterpillar, which is kind of camouflaged is they're chopping away. So in this case, they're pretty easy just to pick off. Um, and then you can get rid of them if you want. Um, the thing is, they turn into these really beautiful butterflies. And so we don't like to discourage them too much. Uh, the black swallowtail butterflies, very really pretty. So again, you can pick them off by hand. They're usually not so bad that you need to be spraying. If they were just totally devastating crop, you might use BT or the spinosad again, uh, but generally you won't have to do that. You can just pick them up by hand. And I will tell you, if you have kids or grandchildren and you want to teach them about butterflies, you can actually capture some of these caterpillars and you can just take like a scissors or clippers and cut off the stem that they're growing on, put it in a jar that has some holes on it, and then pick some more leaves like from the same plant, you know, maybe some of the older parsley leaves or some dill or, or wild Queen Anne's lace or something like that. Something that's not going to hurt too much if you pick it from your garden. Old cilantro leaves and you put it in uh, with your caterpillar, it will eat those leaves. And then every couple of days, give it a few more leaves and it will just keep on eating until it reaches its full caterpillar size and then it will form that chrysalis. And um, it's kind of exciting. And if that happens in the summer, I think it's like 21 days or 28 days. I can't remember. You have to look it up. And then once that chrysalis is formed, then the butterfly will come out in like three to four weeks. And you can watch it and in the jar. And then once it happens in the jar, then you can open it up and you can actually let it fly out. And it's just really fun to watch the little butterfly go free. And it's just fun. And it's a learning scientific science experiment that you can do in your backyard. All right, grasshoppers. Pretty much nothing good to say about grasshoppers. I don't know if you remember the cartoon Bugs Life, the grasshoppers were definitely the bad guys because they came up and ate everything. And they were mean. So anyhow, I don't know if grasshoppers are really mean, but they are really annoying and they do eat everything. They can eat all different kinds of plants. There are stories of what they call locust swarms. And we didn't really have locust swarms in this country that was really, they were actually grasshoppers where just, you know, thousands and millions of them would just, you know, go through the fields and just eat every living crop they could find and just wipe farmers out. Um, and locust swarms happen over in the Middle East more often, and but it's the same type of thing. And they're related to grasshoppers. And they just eat and eat and eat. Yeah. They have large chewing mouth parts, so they're very 
effective at eating. And they like tall grass and weeds. So, um, you know, if you're trying to keep them out of your garden, one of the best things you can do is to mow the grass around your garden really short. Do not let it grow up. Do not let weeds grow up. If there's a big patch of weeds near your garden, right next to it, or in your garden, grasshoppers are going to come. They'll be able to hide in there, and they'll just proliferate, and it'll be bad. Uh, they're difficult to control, especially once they get big. Um, there are some sprays, some organic sprays that will work on them when they're small. So lots of times you see little baby grasshoppers hopping around. You think, oh, aren't they cute? They're little baby grasshoppers. But they are not. They're going to grow into big grasshoppers, and they're going to make big holes and cause problems for you. So if you're going to try and spray them, spray them early in the spring, like now, when they're small, they're about half inch long and you can actually control them like with neem. Um, there's actually some poison baits that you can use. Um, grasshoppers really, really like bran, like wheat bran or oat bran. So sometimes people will take an insecticide that maybe they would not use in their garden, um, something like seven, which I don't recommend for using in your garden. But if you put it on the, the bait, like the spray it on the um, the brand, the corn brand or the wheat brand, and you put it out in little trays, um, then the grasshoppers will be attracted to that on the edge of your garden. They'll come eat that and it'll kill them. Um, you just have to be careful about leaving it out because you don't want like birds or whatever to come along or cats or dogs to come and eat it up. So, um, but it can be an effective way to bait or sprays. There are some biological controls, one called Nosema, which um, can help control the life cycles for um, you know, the, the grasshoppers, but it's not something that happens real quick, so it takes a while. But grasshoppers can be annoying, so the most thing to do the best is get rid of the weeds out of your garden, and don't let them get big, and keep the grass and weeds cut really short all around the garden as far as you can. All right, the harlequin bug is another really nasty pest. You can pretty much count on harlequin bugs it likes to eat, again, on members of the cabbage family as a, a true bug. Um, we call it true bug because not all bugs are insects. I mean, yeah, all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. So it's a specific family that's called the true bugs, the hemipteras. And um, so squash bugs, harlequin bugs, um, anything that has bug after its first name is one of the members of the true bug. There's also some beneficial members of the bug family. There's assassin bugs, soldier bugs, and things like that. Um, there's some, some ones that are predators. Anyhow, harlequin bug, called harlequin because it has this really fancy design on its back, very brightly colorful. Um, feeds on members of the cabbage family. It doesn't chew big holes in them, but it, you know the leaves, after enough of them, are sucking up the juice, the life out of the plant. The plant will be weakened and not do well. And of course, if it's you know the cabbage or broccoli, the part you want to eat, doesn't make it look very appetizing. Um, so it does not have the sprays are not easy to do, especially for the adults. So sometimes hand picking them is the best thing to do. Sometimes a combination of uh, safer soap because it helps coat their their your skin, their skeleton, makes it difficult for them to breathe because they breathe through their skin. Um, and combine that with neem or pyrethrin, those are two organic sprays we'll talk about a little bit here. Um, so sometimes that combination works pretty good. Um, here you can see what the little eggs look like. They're kind of interesting. Um, they're kind of tiny, but you'll see them underneath a leaf or sometimes on the top of a leaf. And they look like little striped barrels. and they're you know, be all grouped together like that. And so if you see them, you can pick those off. Um, and of course, once they hatch out, the little small nymphs, again, that's a good stage to try and spray them, but um, you won't necessarily know what you're looking for. So um, try to become familiar with the different life cycle stages, and then you can actually spray them when they're smaller. When they get bigger, um, it's more difficult, but you can still try the safer soap and the neem oil with the pyrethrin. Flea beetles are a member of the beetle family, the Coleoptera. 
like that cucumber beetle. The thing about flea beetles is they're pretty small. They're usually black, although there's some other colors. And they actually kind of jump like a flea. Like if you go to touch one of these little guys, um, it'll go jump. And it's not actually a flea, but it has very strong jumping abilities. And uh, they're not going to get on your cats or your dogs. They pretty much only eat holes and leaves. Uh, but they don't, because they're tiny, they don't eat big holes. But if you get enough of them, it will reduce the ability of the plant to function, like we talked about. Specifically, like eggplant is one of the favorite. If you have eggplant, I can almost guarantee you will have leaf beetles, I'm sorry, flea beetles show up. And the flea beetles will pick on your eggplant. And if you get too many, um, they can just you know, slow down the growth of your eggplant. Um, organic chemical controls would be spinosad and pyrethrin. Um, work pretty good on these guys. Um, so anyhow, again, not a, a terrible pest, but um, they don't bother the fruit so much, but they do bother the leaves. Also, you'll see them on things that have kind of hairy leaves. So think of like radishes and turnips and Chinese cabbage and things like that. All right, leaf hoppers are something that many people aren't even aware of. Um, they do go hopping about on leaves. I see them a lot when I'm mowing grass, especially if the grass has gotten a little tall and it's kind of weedy and I'm mowing and you'll see lots of these little leaf hoppers just flying around. So that's another good reason for keeping your grass cut short. There won't be as much foliage for them to eat. Um, they're pretty tiny. They suck plant juices. Again, because of their sucking mouth parts, they will spread diseases. Um, particularly in cucumbers and the cantaloupe and things like that, but other things. They do multiply in the tall grass. So as I mentioned, keep your grass cut short around your garden. It will help control the leaf hoppers. You can control them with chemical sprays of the neem oil and spinosad are fairly effective. All right, squash bug. That's probably one of the worst pests. And I will tell you um, that Regardless of how good a gardener you are, you're going to have problems with squash bugs if you grow squash. And often it gets so discouraging that people say, you know what, I'm not going to grow squash ever again. And I don't know if you need to go to that extreme because squash are good. They're tasty. I love zucchini. I love yellow squash, butternut. I love all the squash. They're very tasty, important food group. Um, but um, can be difficult. So sometimes maybe taking a year off isn't a bad idea. Um, there's lots of different ways to control. Um, they have needle-like mouth parts. This is one of the ones we first saw at the very beginning. And so they you know, are sucking the juices from the plants. They weaken the leaves. You're not going to see big holes in the leaves, uh, but they'll suck the juice and the leaves will just kind of look bad and they won't do well and eventually they'll die. Um, the adults have this hard shell that's almost immune to any insecticide spray. Um, there are some really toxic chemical sprays that Professional growers use farmers. Um, unfortunately, they are not the kind of thing I would want to use in my garden, and probably you're not going to want to use in your garden, just because they have um, they're, they're pretty persistent in the environment. Um, so it could have longer term effects. They're more toxic for you and for other critters in the environment. So generally, not a good thing. So um, don't think too much about trying to spray the adults. Um, but so. What you can do is several different things. So think of like how we talked about that integrated pest management. This is a classic case where there's going to be several things that you can do to prevent these, these guys from taking over. And one of them is when you see eggs um, on the underneath of the leaves, and here in the picture on the right, you'll see all these little brown eggs all kind of attached to the underside of the leaves, occasionally be a stem or the upper side. And uh, if you see that, literally, you can just take your fingernails and just tear that little section of leaf off. It would be about the size of a, a nickel or a quarter, and that won't hurt the leaf uh, nearly as much as all those little critters, you know, hatching out and starting to suck the, the juice out of your plant. So whenever you see those, just pull those off, kind of scout. If you have very many plants, it can take a lot of time. So um, really, zucchini plants, you only need like one or two or three maybe and if you take good care of them by picking off these eggs 
they'll probably survive. Um, if you don't, you're going to need more because they're going to start dying one by one slowly from this and uh, the squash vine borer. So um, anyhow, take good care of your plants and control them. So again, when they hatch out, they almost look like little tiny spiders, but they actually have six legs and they kind of creep around. They're kind of creepy looking and they start sucking the juice from the plants. But at this stage in the lower left, um, they're fairly easy to control with sprays, like the neem oil, pyrethrin, spinosad, um, will all have effect on them. Some people say um, safer soap too. I, I haven't really had experience with that, but it's possible. Um, so at this stage, before they get very big, and they look like a little spider that just hatched out, they're definitely vulnerable. <coughs> So um, removing the eggs and spraying them at this stage. The other thing you can do, um, this is getting a little bigger up here, but still got the softer shell. This is the adult that has the hard shell. The adult with the hard shell, you can capture them and pick them off by hand because they are you know, adults and they are mature adults. And so they're gonna be breeding, mating and um, having babies and so um, I don't know how to tell a male from a female, it doesn't matter. If you see an adult, get rid of it because it's going to be breeding and um, helping contributing to eggs being laid. So just get rid of them. One of the ways that you can do that is uh, they kind of like being in the cool of the, when it's the hot part of the day. So like if you lay down a board, like a, a one by six board um, or a one by eight or something like that, even a one by four, something that's flat, and uh, lay it down in the path next to your bed, next to your squash plants, and um, go out in the cool of the day. And if you have squash bugs, the adult will go under there and hide underneath it. So you flip that board over and you can see them and you can squash them. And it's actually better if you can squash them right onto the board because if you try to squash them into the dirt, their hard shell, I've actually had it right. Step on them in the soil and as soon as I do that, <coughs> they get up and they start walking away <coughs> because the soil is so soft. Excuse me, my throat is getting kind of dry here. So anyhow, that, get rid of the adults, get rid of the eggs, and get rid of the, the nymphs, the little babies, um, by spraying. So lots of different ways. <coughs> Again, here it shows you a close-up of what they look like. And that's at the stage when they're vulnerable to those organic insecticides that I just mentioned. All right, so stink bugs are related, part of that true bug family. And one of the ways they talk about the true bugs is they have flat bodies. So, and they also say they are shield shaped. They're shaped like a shield. But here you can see kind of this classic shield shape, not so much on the, um, Squash bug, but still kind of flat again and shield shape. Um, so those are, are true bugs. And the same thing back on that harlequin bug, um, which was back here again. See the shape like a shield? Those are signs of the true bugs. All right. Back to the stink bugs. Um, some people will call the squash a stink bug, and they do stink when you squash them. Um, but again, same thing, they suck the juice from plants, many different kinds of stink bugs. Uh, there's the marmorated stink bug, the tarnished stink bug, um, and lots of times they can ruin the fruits. They're particularly bad on blackberries and raspberries. Like sometimes they'll come out and you'll see, you know how the, the blackberries divided into all these little sections. Those are called druplets in each one and it gets pollinated and little druplets form and into a a aggregate berry, uh, a whole bunch of little tiny fruits kind of together. And what they do is the ones that uh, the stink bug sticks its little um, um, sucking mouth parts into, it pierces them and sends an enzyme in there to adjust it. It kind of ruins those, it makes them go rotten and it kind of ruins the whole berry. So I'm not looking at that blackberry like, oh, that looks great, it looks terrible and I don't want to eat it. So they can be a real problem. Again, hard to control. If you can um, 
try and get them when they're young. You can pick them off by hand as adults um, and you know, try to control them by young with the organic sprays. Tarnished plant bug is another member of that family. Um, I don't see this one very often, but it does kind of pick on strawberries. If you ever see a strawberry that has like a strange shape to it, um, it's got kind of this big indentation here. You can see this one. That's one that's been pierced by um, the tarnished plant bug, and that's called cat facing damage because it kind of gives it a little face of like a cat, I guess, kind of imaginative. Damages soft fruits, especially like strawberries. Um, they overwinter in the leaves around plants. The garden sanitation, picking up dead leaves, picking up dead plants at the end of the year is really helpful so they can't hang out. There are um, squash bugs, they overwinter just in the soil. Um, so if you can go by and uh, till up your soil in the fall, that helps bury them down deep and start stops them from you know, uh, going over the winter. All right, there's another really bad pest of squash. We are getting near the end here, so it won't be too much longer. But this one is called the squash vine borer. And it actually is from a caterpillar that, or the larva, which is a caterpillar that feeds inside the stems of the squash plant. So there is this moth, and it's kind of a rusty colored moth. It's got some brown, reddish, you know, and then some black on it. And it almost looks like it's a wasp of some kind. Flies around kind of fast, but it's not a wasp. It is an actual moth, and it generally will be hanging around your squash plants. And usually, if it's actually laying eggs, it'll land on the base of that plant and lay eggs. And what happens is it lays those eggs right on the base, and they hatch. And as soon as they hatch, they're little tiny caterpillars, and right away, they start boring into the inside of your squash vine. And once they get inside, you can spray all you want. It's not going to affect it because the spray won't reach it. So if you spray on a weekly basis with your organic sprays, like the BT or the Spinoza, or you could probably use the Neem also, it will help control them because you'll be getting them likely when they hatch out, unless you miss it, you know. Um, but generally, that, that will help. But it means you've got to do it every week. Um, there's another way to control, um, because what happens is as they get bigger and bigger, they eat more and more of the inside, um, you're basically blocking all the inside of this plant and destroying this plant's stem, which is the way that it uses to take up water and nutrients. And so the plant can't really get nutrients. And then someday you'll come out and your whole zucchini plant, which looked fine yesterday, all of a sudden is flat on the ground. Or sometimes it's just half of the plant, depending on where the stem was. Um, and it's just flat on the ground and looks totally dead. So that is really, really frustrating. And, you know, sometimes I'll read about this in books and I don't think it works very well. They'll tell you, like, to take a knife or a razor blade, try to cut that stem open and dig out that little caterpillar inside. And yeah, you can do that. But usually by the time you can do that, because you know what's in there, it's too late. It's already bored enough and the plant is dead on the ground and doesn't do much. Um, but there is another way to control, um, and this involves using um, some BT, um, and that is to inject it into the stem of the plant. And so what you can use is a syringe. Um, you can maybe get a syringe from like a veterinary supply, it would not be like one that a human would use. Um, and it doesn't even have to have the needle in it. Um, you can make a hole in the stem, like with a little nail, and then just the plastic thing, you know, the little syringe, fill it up with a mixture of BT liquid, um, you know, and then inject it into the plant. And that will kill little tiny um, caterpillars that have bored its way into the inside. And in fact, you can actually do this as a preventative method. Like if you did this every couple of weeks, injected it into your, your squash plant, um, it would always be there. So once the, the squash vine borers show up and the eggs hatch and they start to pour into there, as soon as they got in there, there would already be DT on the inside, kind of flowing through the veins of that plant, and that would help control. So it really does work. 
I've done it, um, and it makes it possible to get, you know, squash plants. Um, so you can have squash. Yet another way to help protect your squash plants from both the vine borer and the squash bug is to put row covers over your plants um, while they're growing. Um, basically, the row cover acts as a screen, will screen out the vine borers, screen out the, the squash bugs, unless they're already in the soil right underneath. Um, they could come up from the soil. Um, but it will screen out you know, the insects trying to come into the squash or attracted to the squash. And eventually, of course, your squash will start flowering and you will have to take the row cover off so that the bees can get in there and pollinate the flowers so you'll have some squash. But once that happens, you can go ahead and cover up for a little while and then maybe once every couple of days, leave it open for a while and you'll just cut down on the chances that you're going to have the squash vine borer coming in there. So it really can be effective to use some row cover as a screen. Um, this caterpillar here, you don't see very often, but when people see it, it's pretty dramatic. It's called the tomato hornworm, or a distant relative is the tobacco hornworm. The thing is that they will both feed on um, tomatoes because they're in the same family. Um, sometimes they'll be on a potato leaf, but usually it's a tomato. And you won't notice it until all of a sudden um, it looks like there's some leaves missing from your tomato plant. And if it's a small one, it can be kind of shocking to see that happen. If it's a big one, it's not as big a deal. Um, and if you look around, you'll see this big green caterpillar. Um, and lots of times you won't see it until it's pretty big. It'll be like two or three inches long and fat, you know. Um, if you get them while they're small, they're great. So you can just pick them off by hand. Usually there's not too many. Um, there's also a control in nature, a biological control. There is a little predator wasp that comes around and lays eggs right on the back of this caterpillar. So it comes and finds the caterpillar, it lays eggs, and you see these little eggs on the back. Um, and it's kind of like a little uh, pupa. And so, and then once they hatch out of their thing, they, they come and they start, or basically as they're growing, they're eating the caterpillar from the inside out. And so then they'll, hatch out as adults and they'll fly away and look for other caterpillars. So if you ever see one in nature and it's got these little white things on the back, leave it there just to give those things a chance to hatch out and spread out and go chase the other caterpillars. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting. So they're actually a parasite on those caterpillars. Uh, there is another insect called rips and it's kind of a weird word um, because it's the plural and the singular is the same. So if you have several of them, they're actually thrips. If you just have one, it's called the thrips. Um, it's kind of funny, not just a thrip, but thrips. And they have piercing and rasping mouth parts. And um, where I see them most often is on onions and garlic. If you ever look at your onion leaves and they look kind of funny, kind of blotchy, a little bit yellow blotches or white blotches, instead of just the dark green all the way along. If you look real closely, sometimes you'll actually see the thrips. They're pretty tiny. Um, once it gets hot, so like later in the season when the onions are getting mature, um, they're, you know, affecting the leaves. By that point, it's usually not too big a deal, and I don't worry about it too much because, A, they're not boring into the bulb of your onion. They're just boring into the, you know, trying to eat the leaves, and they're sucking the juice out of the leaves. Um, sure, if it happens early enough in the season, it will cause the leaves not to do well. Um, Probably the best control would be neem oil um, to kind of smothers their little skins and helps to control them. So um, if you have a real bad problem with thrips, sometimes they'll be on flowers too. Um, and like the flowers of vegetables like squash and cucumbers and watermelon, um, they can be a problem. But um, most often I see them on onions and garlic. Bean leaf beetle is another beetle and it, kind of looks like a ladybug at different stages. It kind of looks like a cucumber beetle. And it eats really big holes in leaves of bean plants. You don't see it very often, uh, but if something's eating a bean, there's a good chance either it's a bean leaf beetle. I think there's a special one called the Mexican leaf beetle, bean beetle. And then, of course, Japanese beetles will also eat bean leaves. Um, 
the larva feed on the roots, the adult feed on the pollens, and also sometimes on the seeds. Sometimes if you wait a little bit longer to planting your green beans, you'll miss out on these. Uh, but when they're young, you can usually try pyrethrins and control them pretty good that way. But again, you don't see this every year, and it's, sometimes it's not very bad. The Japanese beetle, on the other hand, a lot of people are getting worried about it. Um, the larvae feed on grass roots. Um, adults feed on the foliage of different plants. We have really bad problems with them out here on our cannas, our big canna plants. They'll so chew on, so we pick them off and drop them into soapy water dish detergent um, that coats their wings so they can't fly away. Um, we also put traps out. There's special Japanese beetles traps you can get. And sometimes people think they'll, the traps aren't a good idea because it'll just attract the beetles. It has an attraction to it. But I would rather attract them to the traps rather than your garden. Because if you have grapes or you have cherries or um, like I say, those canna, canna plants, canna lilies, sometimes we call it, it's going to come feed on those plants. Um, sometimes we'll just attack green beans. Sometimes they'll just pick on something because they want to pick on it. Um, so having traps out is a really good way to do that. If you want to come see what the traps look like sometime, we have some here at the community gardens. You can order them through the mail, some of the garden centers and start to carry the traps. But also hand picking, if you stay on top of it, does seem to work pretty well also. Um, Japanese beetles, if you've never seen them, they're this makes it look kind of brown. Usually they're kind of bright, shiny green. Of course, here's the grub. Um, there's some organic um, grub control that you can put into your soil. And it takes a while to get it under control, but that can help also. All right, almost done. Spider mites are actually not insects. They're like little tiny arachnids, members of the arachnid family. So distantly related to spiders. Uh, they're very small, difficult to see. Um, they multiply really fast in hot weather. Um, they can kill tomato plants. And that's where we often see them is on the underside of the leaves um, on tomato plants. If you see little tiny spots, little white spots on your leaves, it's a good sign you've got some spider mites going on. There's different versions of them. The one on the top is called the two-spotted mite. These down here are called red spider mites. Um, so it doesn't really matter. The effect is the same. Uh, neem oil works very well because it coats them. Safer soap, that product that I talked about is made out of soap as well. Works well. Again, coats them. And pyrethrin also seems to control them pretty well. Thing with spider mites is once you spray, you want to spray again three days later because they will have laid some eggs and the eggs will hatch out. So if you do it the second time, you'll get the ones that just hatched out. They won't have had time to lay eggs generally. So spray once and make sure you get on the underside of the leaves and then do it again three days later. There you can see what the damage looks like on tomato plants. See this little blotchy stuff everywhere? That's pretty bad when it happens. If you look really close, you can't really see that. But if you, you know, zoom in, oops, trying to zoom in but not doing very well, um, that you can see them sometimes with the magnifying. And last of all, slugs. Again, not a true insect, but rather a mollusk, you know, related to snails and other things with shells. Pretty much slugs like to come out at night, and they do <coughs> love lettuce, but they'll eat other plants, and they are eating machines. So if you have some good looking little lettuce seedlings, and you come out in the morning and you're looking at them, and all of a sudden the whole plant is almost gone, generally that would be slugs because it almost always happens at night. And uh, especially in the cool, moist weather, and if you have mulch, they, they love to hide under the mulch. So that's the bad part about putting your mulch down too soon. I like to wait a little while to put my mulch out until the soil is getting warmer and less likely to have problems with slugs and snails and things like that. Again, the snail is just a slug that has a shell on it. The slug is just a snail without a shell. Um, there are some organic pesticide controls. We say organic meaning natural. Um, there's a, a thing called sluggo, uh, and it's basically iron phosphate. And iron is a safe thing to use in your garden. In fact, sometimes you have to add iron uh, if your plant is if your plants are deficient. Um, 
iron phosphate will kill them and it's not a big dangerous poison to put out for children and pets. So it works really, really well. So, um, some resources. Um, we've talked about some of these chemicals. Again, the neem oil comes from the oil that's pressed from the nuts or the seeds of the neem tree. It's a tropical tree. And neem is kind of interesting because not only does it control insects, but it also does control some fungus. So it gives you some natural fungicide benefits. Um, spinosa, we talked about, um, used a lot for members of the, the uh, Lepidoptera, which is butterflies and moths that turn into caterpillars, um, but also some beetles and miscellaneous things. So you just have to read the instructions and see if it works for you. Uh, BT, again, comes in that liquid form called thuricide or liquid BT, or it's a powder form, a dust called dipel dust. Um, and that's only members of the, the Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies, which has the larva, the caterpillars that eat healthy plants. Then pyrethrin is made from a flower, and it's pretty good against most flying insects and a lot of the younger stages of things. Um, it's very safe. Um, it's one of the only insecticides that they're allowed to use inside dairy barns where they're milking cows because it's safe to use. It breaks down very quickly, does not have toxic effect, long-term toxic effect for people or pets. Um, actually, lots of times, uh, it's what's used on pets for fleas and uh, things on cats and dogs. And then there's safer soap, that soap product that I talked about, which doesn't do too much for bigger insects, but could be really good for those small aphids and spider mites and white flies and things like that. So those are kind of some of the main um, organic chemicals out there. There's also some new ones coming out. There's some um, essential oils, um, like there's a citrus oil, um, I think maybe rosemary oil, different things like that that have some, you know, potential insecticidal effect. You just have to do some reading about those materials. Um, some good sources um, for some of these controls, and also if you're if you're trying to order some insects, like some lace wings or some different kinds of ladybugs or whatever different pests that I mean different plants that will eat pests, you know, predators. Um, these companies like um, Gardens Alive, GardensAlive.com, or Arbico, um, they have a website too. Also, Johnny's Selected Seeds is a seed company, and they have lots of materials for controlling these organic controls. And we do carry some of these at our office. Um, so come and see what we got. I think some of that information is on the website. We're trying to come up with a really good handout that will list all the different insecticides and talk about them in, in more detail. So you know like which one to use for which insect. So watch for that soon. We'll try to have that out so you can access it on our website. And now I think that's it. I'm gonna um, answer a few questions. And the first one I have is what pest leaves little white marks and holes on my rose leaves? Um, and, and the person was guessing that maybe it was flea beetles. And I think that's a pretty good guess. Because um, A, you don't necessarily see them. Um, so, um, you know, it might be that. It could also be something else. The thing is to try and look and see what you can see. Maybe cut off a rose leaf, put it in a jar, uh, bring it to us or take it to someone. I'll tell you who's a good expert um, on Roses is the lady who is the rosarian. I can't remember her name right now, but she takes care of the rose garden at Ruth Park. And she might have good answers for that. Um, also, the Master Gardener's Hotline, you might try them for that. I don't deal as much with roses, but it could very well be the sea beetles. All right. So, uh, the second question does anything eat the caterpillar of the white butterfly? Um, there probably are things that eat it. There's probably some of the predator beetles and, of course, praying mantis. Um, and, of course, birds will eat caterpillars. The unfortunate thing is probably none of them are going to be effective enough to can really give a good control. So it's not like you can just go out and buy a package of the XYZ beetle, probably, um, at least not to my knowledge, um, that will just control all these little caterpillars. Your best bet really is the BT. And 
you know, also screening them out using row cover for as long as you can until it's time to harvest. And you can really keep a lot of them under control. But the BT or the spinosad uh, will really help you uh, control those pests. Um, all right, so an another person had recommendation for the milky spore on the Japanese beetle larva. And yes, that's the biological um, product I was referring to for Japanese beetles. It's called milky spore. Um, and it's basically kind of a powder that you um, put out over your soil, uh, or maybe it comes in granules, and you're doing this on your lawn, and that will help control the larvae. The thing is, <clears throat> usually, <coughs> the problem is the Japanese beetles are eating your um, plants right now, and so it's not going to do a thing for them, but if you put it down when they tell you to, usually I think of this like late summer and fall, have to check the directions on that. That will control the larvae, which are underground um, eventually. And um, so they won't have as many Japanese beetles the following year. But so won't do anything for the Japanese beetles this year, but it will help for the future, which is good because the more you can cut down on the number, the better. So definitely milky spore is something you can work with. Um, do some reading on it, check it out on the internet, and you'll find out more about it. Um, but the Japanese beetle traps are probably the best thing for like right now, whenever Japanese beetles start coming and they are coming soon, um, start eating on things. And then after a while, the Japanese beetles aren't around as much and you don't need to worry about it. But the traps, having them out while they're actively feeding can really help. So I think that's all the questions I've seen for today. Um, if you do, again, catch something, want to bring it into us in a jar or a baggie, we'll Ziploc, we can look at it, try to help you figure it out, and what can be the best thing to use. And again, you can look at our website and see some of the organic chemicals that we offer. Um, so we'll try to get that updated. And they're available for sale here at our office. And the good news also, they are more uh, popular. You can order them through the mail. You can also order them or just buy them at places even like Lowe's and um, Home Depot now. But make sure you're buying the right product because They'll be mixed right in with the other insecticides. So you'll see pyrethrum, you'll see neem oil. Um, they'll have different brand names, uh, but you read the label and see what's, what's, what's on the label, and that will tell you if it's the product that you actually want. All right, thanks for everyone for coming and listening tonight. This will be available to watch later. Um, you can also email us at contact at KCCG if you have insect questions. I will try to answer them for you. Um, and good luck, everyone, with their garden. It's getting lots of rain right now, which is helping our plants to grow, which is great, making it difficult to plant. Uh, so before too long, we'll start seeing some more insects out there. And hopefully they will not bother you too much. So all right. Thanks, everybody.